So you like to look at people's heads, do you? <laughs> what is, or is it that? the soul? Is it the soul that you look into? You mean with counseling? Yeah. Um, I love having conversations. Ah, uh, yeah. I think I think you can relate to that, right? <laughs> Kinda. At least that's what I. That's how I play on TV. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I love talking to people about stuff. Um, obviously counseling, it's, a, it's not a, it's more one-sided, right? Um, sometimes it's more listening and more the other person talking. I mean, I think ideally you don't want to be talking too much if you're the therapist, but so I do have sessions where it, it, it's, you know, it's a very dynamic discussion and conversation. I, those are the ones that I enjoy the most for sure. How did you get into that? Was it accident or fate or a burning desire inside? Yeah, it was kind of a, a circuitous route. Um, I studied criminology, and after that I was thinking about doing policing, and then that kind of didn't pan out. And so then I was thinking about, I had thought about counseling and social work before, but um, hmm. I just remember thinking about it and just thinking, like, sitting in a room talking to someone sounds really boring and lame. So Yeah. Um, and I also was kind of scared of burnout cause I know like social work, any kind of social services has high burnout. So, but then after, um, I was a youth worker for a while and really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed just one-to-one -one work, like meeting with these, you know, young men and trying to help them out. And, um, and then after that, that confirmed, okay, I think I could do this. And then went back to do my masters of social work and then, uh, hmm. yeah, I really enjoy it now. So I'm glad I did. Masters of Social Work. Yeah. Yeah. How was that? Um, it was uh not good. <laughs> I mean, it started out good. It was a small cohort of thirteen people. I did foundations, which means most at least in BC and Canada, most people have to do um like an undergraduate in social work and then a master's. And so it's like a four year undergraduate and then a one year masters. Mm -hmm. Um but there's a found thing called a foundation program where if you already have a bachelor's degree and you have uh, at least two years of experience in social service work, then you could um, just do a two years master's. So the first year is kind of like uh, a condensed, you know, bachelor of social work. Um, and so the first year was 13 people and everyone was super lovely. And um, yeah, it started off with great high hopes, but um, it kind of devolved over the course of <laughs> two years. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was kind of unfortunate actually, but I did learn a lot, not like from the content of the curriculum, but from that experience. And so what did deteriorated over time? Was it the content of the curriculum or was it, uh, the, uh, climate of the cohort? It was the climate of the cohort. Like, yeah, we, st we started out, everyone was super gung-ho, super happy, super connected. Um, but, um, there was just some conflict between like me and another classmate and also that classmate. And like, she was a little bit, um, uh, confrontational with the, with the teachers. Um, and so it just, it just made it unsafe to talk about things. And then there was another classmate who also had an issue with one of the teachers and it became a big thing. And so there was just, yeah, it, it just, it just created awkwardness and particularly for me and that, between like how I felt with that other student, like being around them, which is ironic because they were one, probably one of my favorite people in the program, like initially, and then ended up being like really, really uncomfortable being around them. And so because of their relationship to authority or how they went about exerting their uh, will. on others. Yeah. I don't know. Like they were, they, they're really passionate. And they're really, you know, strong in their beliefs, which is great. Um, but I think it was, they're just like very condescending and very sarcastic to anyone who disagreed with them. So if, if there was like, you know, there's a cohort of 13 people. So, and the three hour seminar or something, right. So a lot of it is discussion. In fact, most, there's not that much lecture, right. Maybe like a 40 minute lecture and then the rest is discussion. So, so you're obviously asking a lot of questions, but when when someone had a different belief to her or a different stance she would just kind of like ask rhetorical questions in a very condescending sarcastic way 
and it was very passive aggressive. Or sometimes she would just call out the teachers. Like one time, the teacher was like talking about the theories. It was a, it was um, different theories on groups, like working with groups in social work. And she called them out. She's like, all of these theorists are like white people. Like, where is the where is the um, theorists from different cultural perspectives? And the teacher himself, you know, it's not like he was even white. He was from Colombia, um, and he was like well you know i'd be happy to share those but I, like this is what we have this is the theories that exist right these are the th like you know so he's like if you have those then i'm you know i'd be happy to look at them but so that kind of thing right just a sort of like questioning or criticizing but not offering anything like you know substantial um and then there were there could be like not always but sometimes people would jump into it. And like, even I did at one, one occasion to my shame um, earlier on before I, you know, started changing some of my views on things. Most of the, like, it was kind of split. Like most of the class, maybe half the class, like didn't really like what she was saying and doing others maybe tacitly supported her, but wouldn't overtly. And I was probably the only person who spoke directly against her. And sometimes after class, people would say like, you know, like, I'm glad you said that, or I, you know, I'm surprised. I I agree with what you said, but not during class, just after class, right? So, because mm -hmm. I didn't want to be embroiled in any, you know, conflict or yeah, yeah. How did your positions or point of view change? Well, I was struggling with a lot of uh, guilt, white guilt. I was I took this course called white Critical. guilt. Yeah. So hold on. So there's this thing called guilt. Um, it comes in different shades now. So. <laughs> well, feeling guilty about being white, I guess. I guess oh, you could call that white okay. guilt, right? Or about um, my so you, you believe yourself to be white then? Uh, I I don't really like that term, but but for the sake of simplicity, um, you know, if you call a European white, then yeah, then I guess so. Yeah. So that's um, where your your ancestry is from. Yeah, I'm a mix of European, like Irish, English, Scottish, and Italian. Um, and in one course in particular, brought up these feelings. It wasn't actually, I had a course on critical race theory. It wasn't that course. It was a course on indigenous relations. And um, even prior to that course, I knew quite a bit about the indigenous community. I worked for an organization that was working with indigenous youth, and I have family members who are indigenous. So it's not, it wasn't anything new. To like Canada. Yeah. 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 So I, I know, I, I know a lot about the topic, but but there was an assignment where you had to bring something. It was kind of like show and tell. You had to bring something from your cultural heritage to class and then talk about it and how that how that thing might get in the way of working with indigenous people. Mm -hmm. So it kind of like, it didn't overtly say that those things were bad, but it sort of invited you to reflect negatively on your own heritage, I think. I don't know if that was the point of it. That was just how I and when I when people shared, there was a lot of kind of like cultural self flagellation. It was really kind of gross. But but so for me, anyways, I had all these feelings, and so I just googled the term white guilt, and um, and this book popped up, White Guilt by Shelby Steele, who is a black conservative. Um, and anyways, I read the book, and it exposed me to a lot of conservative ideas that in a way where I was more open to it because I've always been more left-leaning in my life. Um, and I always kind of thought conservative people were either like had a lack of compassion or were just uninformed, right? So um, kind of, you know, I guess I wasn't, I never really took their view seriously or, or investigated them, right? And then I also went, you know, throughout high school and university, I was never really exposed to them in my classes. Um, uh, so all my teachers and professors were more left-leaning. My parents are more left-leaning. My family's more left-leaning. So I just Your never country's really... more left-leaning. Like, to... <laughs> yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm in Vancouver, right? Like they call it the left coast for a reason. But um, so I, I was exposed to it. And then once I once I started like agreeing with a lot of these saying, I just you know started reading a lot of other books on different topics. So that was like, kind of like a conservative take on race relations. And so then I read conservative books on different topics to see okay. You know, um, what other things might I have been wrong about or have I 
have I might have been, if I had heard the other argument, might agree more with that other argument. But just because it was never presented to me, I never really thought about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. what happened to your white guilt? <laughs> um, uh, it's gone, honestly. But, but creepily and weirdly, I do sometimes experience uh, some. I hate to use the term, but internalized racism, uh, I guess. Like, hmm. you know, I, for example, I was looking on, I was looking on a church website in the States. I'm Christian and I was looking on their website and all of their staff were white and they just seemed very like, you know, kind of traditional. And I just like, I had this thought of like, oh, like, why are they all white? And then I was like, why, like, why does it matter? Like, who cares if they're all white? What if they're all black? Like, I wouldn't care if they're all black. So why do I care that they're all white? So that kind of bothered me, but at least like, at least I'm aware of it now. I think a lot of people, yeah. hmm. they have those feelings, but they don't question them or. Yeah. The, you know. uh, lowest tier or one of the lower levels of what is called woke is just a basic pattern recognition and problemization through pattern recognition and once you get that pattern recogni recognition going on once you start to see race uh, and start to count the beans so to speak then it just kind of steps out and then it's just it's always stepping out at you or popping out at you it's like oh there's this thing there's that person with that race this person with that race this person with that race where's the diversity where's the diversity and uh, i think that the media in general does a lot of work to um, platform or center, uh, so-called, a diversity of skin cast. And then when, you know, let's just say like middle white bread uh, North Americans uh, or just kind of in white communities, they look at their white community and they don't see the representation that they're given through the media, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and since the uh, 2020... Uh, and I guess over the last 10 years, it's been ramping up more and more where, I mean, I know there, there was a report a couple of months ago uh, that all new hires in Fortune 5 companies are all uh, not white. Like mm -hmm. basically the entire culture is, or the, at least the elite culture is uh, implementing some sort of racial, um, uh, I guess, sifting mechanism this reverse racism or this racism that is intended to reverse, uh, you know, some sort of marginal or some sort of like uh, normalization that white people do this thing. Um, so it, I, I'm just trying to process what you're processing. Cause I see it too. Like, Oh, look at all these, these white people or look at all these black people or look at why would they put a black person in this role or a white person in that role? And, and then you can do that too with sex too. Like why mm -hmm. are all the men on TV? Like they're all schlubs or, or pathetic, mm -hmm. you know, and the women are all heroes or misunderstood kind of thing. You, you start to see, mm -hmm. you know, this reversal. Um, and then I don't know what you're supposed to do with that information other than just recognize that you're making a pattern recognition uh. yeah i think i think the one of the underlying assumptions behind the problem problematization of like a you know a lot of one group is that is a sort of belief that unless you're part of a group you can't understand their experience so for example if you know only have males in leadership then by definition that company is not going to be hospitable to women because they don't have any women speaking into their leadership. So, so they can't understand women unless they have a woman on the board. Right. And to some extent, I, I think there's a, there's a kernel of truth in it, which is, as we know, right, like half truth throw is the best lies. Um, so there is a truth that there's, there is a lack of experiential knowledge of being a woman for, for, you know, an all, all male leadership team or something like that. But that doesn't mean that they can't listen to women and implement like thoughts of women, right? It doesn't mean you have to have a woman in leadership in order to have a healthy company for women, right? Mm -hmm. That's the non sequitur. Mm. In the case of counseling specifically, and I guess social work more broadly, uh, and even pastoral work, um, any, any sort of humanitarian type work, there is a reality to cultural uh, differences and mm -hmm. to being able to see the world through other people's eyes. Now, I don't, I take umbrage with the social critical social justice 
standpoint epistemology where they say if if you are not this then you can't know what that is um because i i think that that is uh it's really insulting to human beings like human beings can't understand human beings like i don't have an imagination yeah. like if i read a book about like uh I don't know, like some Bushman, like I would never be able to understand his thoughts and feelings as he's going through this mm. adventure with a tiger or whatever. Like we watched the, the gods must be crazy not too long ago. And like, I can understand like <laughs> the differences and that's where a lot of fun and humor comes from these different, uh, these differences. So these differences are real. I think that the critical social justice uh, way of thinking about them is crude and base and also, um, even psychologically harmful, if not criminal, uh, to a certain degree. Mm. But what are your thoughts on when you as a counselor are working with a woman or you're working with uh, an indigenous person or somebody from a different culture? Like, to what degree does that that cultural competency, so-called, yeah. come into play and serve you? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean... I work with a lot of indigenous people and I, I, there's a, there's insurance they can get like the sessions covered through the provincial government. So, so I did a training to like be a provider through there so that they could have it covered and I had to do a training, but like that word cultural competency is like not even in vogue anymore. It's like, Oh, like we can, you can't, you can't be culturally competent. So you just have to be, you just have to be curious. You just have to always be asking questions because you'll never be competent. <laughs> but um, as we know with, you know, it's never good enough, right? It always has to be something more, right? There's always something more progressive than what was two seconds ago, you know, the standard. Um, but um, but to answer your question about how do I, you know, connect with people of different cultures or how do I engage with them if I have a different cultural lens um, and make sure that I'm not imposing my own beliefs or biases onto them because of my, you know, what I grew up with or what I, you know, was normative for me. Um I think that, I think this sounds very overly simplistic, but I think asking questions and, and really kind of trying to learn about their culture, right? Because even indigenous people, right? Like they have, it, within BC, there's like, I don't know how many different groups, but probably over 50 group groupings within BC that are distinct. <laughs> um, and post-contact, like, everything just became lumped into indigenous, right? Because their population was decimated and they needed to, for political reasons, identify as, you know, pan indigenous essentially, right? Mm -hmm. Like even in Vancouver area, North Vancouver, there's the Squamish nation. And I always thought the Squamish nation was like one nation, but there was many nations around that area, but they're just, you know, around the turn of the century, there was like 10 people from each group. So they just amalgamated into the Squamish nation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but, but going back to your question, yeah, asking people questions about what their culture is like and, and, um, it sounds simple, but I think that's as simple as that really, right. Just not, um, and being willing to being willing to do things different. I think being flexible is really important. I find, especially with indigenous, my indigenous clients, especially the ones who aren't urban, right. The ones who grew up on the reservation. So they're more culturally different. This is another interesting question. There's a lot of there's a lot of cultural similarities between uh, rural indigenous people and rural white people more so than rural indigenous people or sorry rural urban people and rural like urban and rural divide is sometimes more salient than the yeah. than yeah. the cultural divide. But but um, being asking questions and being flexible to how they want to do things because my my modality is CBT. It's a very you know cognitive behavioral. It's very logical. And kind of like there's homework but maybe with indigenous people they're a lot more relational so maybe the sessions i do with them i have to be more flexible and i'm eclectic so i don't just use cbt i don't use different approaches so i'm able to do that and it's fine i think mm -hmm. most counselors um are willing to be but i feel like that's one of my strengths as a counselor is that i'm i'm quite flexible to people wanting to work in a different way as long as i can as long as i can adapt that to how i see you know, my own, my own lens, I can't completely abandon my yeah. expertise or what I've learned. Right. But, but being willing to maybe like be more open-handed with the way you do things. Right. Because that is, that is, I think what was a lot of the harm done to indigenous people was saying like, our ways are better than your ways. Let's impose our ways upon you and not learn from any of your ways. And now it's the reverse, you know, 
our ways are terrible and bad because we're colonialists and we need to indigenize everything. Well, that's not, that doesn't make any sense. It's just a reverse of what we did before, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you mean they're more relational? Um, or can be? I think it's like, I guess it's sort of, you know, any cultural that's closer to being like a traditional culture or, or you know, like that's not um, Western individual. So it, this isn't like specific to indigenous people, but I think it's any culture that's more traditional, more collectivist. They just value relationships and like who you know is very important, right? So like if you're in a community, um, you can't just like go and like meet people. You have to like meet with like the people in the village who have, you know, um, some leadership or authority. And then like it's by relationship that you're sort of like vouched for and can gain access to the community. So I've never really done that community that community work on reserve. So mm. that hasn't really applied to me. It's been more in an urban context. But but even then, like I worked in a transition house with a lot of indigenous people in there and I could see that dynamic going on, right? Like if there were certain people in the building who if you knew them and had a relationship with them, that would that would enable me to be able to work or it, it made other people able able to trust me more, I guess, and that mm. I knew that person or that person vouched for me. So, I mean, that's not inherently indigenous or anything, obviously, like, you know, there's, we have that within every culture, but I guess there's just more of a, less of an emphasis on the professionalization, right? The counseling is very professionalized, uh, you know, there's certain things you have to follow and like being willing to be flexible with that, I guess, right? Hmm. Hmm. What is that? What's that? How long have you been practicing? Uh, uh, since, since 2019. Okay. So you're, you're, uh, well, that's f four, four years now. And, uh, how, I guess, is there any specific way in which being in contact with another culture shows you something about your culture that you hadn't seen before or allows you to kind of, I don't think it's bad to criticize your culture. Like, mm -hmm. like there's there's aspects of whiteness. I'm not guilty about them. But aspects of whiteness, like, it'd be nice if we could dance better. You know, stuff like that. You know, you know. There's a kind of a a bureaucraticness to the systems that we've created that is kind of stodgy. You know, and mm -hmm. and I understand. Uh, but then also when uh, fellow whites try to go on, you know, try to romanticize like the, a, a more traditional or native or indigenous mm -hmm. way of being that it's kind of they do it whitely oddly enough like oh you're doing that whitely uh, now you know D does that make any sense like there is kind of like this sense, thing yeah. right it makes total sense right like let's let's um center or celebrate or put forward uh indigenous culture in a way that also aligns with my whatever put yeah. woke political views right yeah. Yeah. like um it's interesting because i'm christian even though you know christians you know were complicit in the residential schools which caused harm to indigenous people um because i'm religious and as spiritual i can connect with a lot of indigenous clients who are also very spiritual right they might not identify as religious and they might not even be christian but but even just having that framework it enables me to work with them on a level that, you know, someone who doesn't have any spirituality can't. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a weird thing, right? Because secularism and generally speaking, the more secular and the more left leaning you are, the more, the more anti-spirituality you are, but that's also a huge part of indigenous culture. Right. So, um, so, so you see people who are, yeah, they're very anti religion generally but when it comes to indigenous they're very pro like i remember when i was in when doing my program like in the indigenous class we were like we did like a we did like the smudging thing and we were like doing like a prayer as a group and a, me and my friend who are christian are like we're not against it we're like okay cool like you know we're not like oh this is like against our religion or something but um but we're like it's it's interesting how that's allowed right how we're allowed to you know kind of mix religion and the state, I guess, because it's a publicly funded institution, right? In in mm -hmm. certain contexts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also kind of a uh, contradiction in what is generally called the left, 
when they support these marginalized communities, but when you go and you honestly meet with these marginalized communities, they have more conservative. They're just more conservative by by definition. They are conserving tradition. They are more into tradition. Into tradition, they're they're more wary of the impersonalization of the yeah, I guess professionalization and bureaucratization. Mm-hmm. And that kind of organization that um, is at the heart of the left, this kind of centralizing, structuralizing, um, putting people into these little different boxes. And when I was at Evergreen, uh, right when that woke stuff was just like kind of still strange to me, I'm like, well, how are these, you guys are all kind of like, there's this intersectional banner and you're all fighting for each other. But what happens when the indigenous people or the native people or the Native Americans don't want to uh, deny the reality of sex because so much of their culture is about sex. And then this trans stuff wants to completely erode mm-hmm. sex. So how are you guys going to get along? So you're, you're helping each other right now to win against Whitey, but your values don't actually align yeah. beyond this one kind of like getting your way right now, you know, and we'll, we'll get yeah. a scratch back system that somebody's going to get scratched a little too hard sometime. Some it's a good point. And that was actually the that kind of specific hypocrisy was the one that led me to the conflict with my classmate. But before I mention that, I just wanted to quickly mention how, like you said, like a lot of indigenous people are very conservative, especially if they're more rural, right? Generally speaking, rural people are more conservative than urban people. But, um, but the media, especially like the Canadian media always focuses on the, the nations that are more, you know, left leaning or anti, you know, anti energy sector, anti, you know, they'll always focus on the Wet'suwet'en who will not allow, you know, the pipeline to go through their land. Meanwhile, there's tons of other indigenous nations like the Shkwepm and other groups which have allowed those to go through their land and they're using that to energize their economies and create jobs and build schools and do all these amazing things which you don't see on the TV. Like, hmm. I only learned that because one of my classmates was from one of those nations and she's like, she's like not super pro energy, but she at least was honest. She's like, yeah, I don't know how I feel about it, but we, you know, we signed deals to let them build through our land and it's really benefiting our nation, right? She was just honest about it. Hmm. Um, Were you just, were you smearing the media as biased just now? Is that what I picked (laughs) up? Canadian media of all all things? Uh, Yeah, they're they're definitely um, pro, I don't know, more left-leaning in Canada, I think. I don't think that's a controversial statement. Um, But... um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So the hypocrisy about, you know, picking and choosing indigenous beliefs or or having beliefs that contradict them, but also saying you promote indigenous people. Um, the the discussion came from the context of like anti-oppressive practice. I'm not a, not sure if you've heard this term, but anti-oppressive practices, like how can we work in pe- with people in a way where we're not oppressing them? Right. OK. Right. So um, anti-oppressive is kind of like anti-racist. It doesn't really make sense. It's like, obviously, we all don't want to be racist. Obviously, why do we need to create a term, right? Whenever someone has to create a term to for something that's obvious, then you know something is up. <laughs> um, but um, but my teacher, uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, he made us read an article on like kind of pro, pro this worldview and then anti. And the anti this worldview was saying, well, who gets to decide what's anti-oppressive, right? What if there's disagreement about that, right? And so I presented that class because it was a presentation and discussion about this woman, Faye Blaney, who's an indigenous woman from the downtown east side. So I'm not sure how much you're familiar with the downtown east side, but it's the poorest postal code in Canada, and there's high, you know, highest rates of HIV AIDS per like capita in North America uh-huh. okay. because of really? the you know drug use and the needles and stuff. Um, and so it's just very concentrated, right? Um, a lot of uh, social housing and just general disorder and drug dealing and open air, yeah. you know, yeah. stuff. So anyways, this lady from the indigenous community, Faye Delaney, she was an advocate for women who were in downtown East side who were being sexually exploited. Um, and, um, she started the, uh, the March for the missing women, right? Because there was a serial killer, Robert Pickton. He, he killed a lot of these women who were, you know, in prostitution and uh, basically the police ignored it because people go missing all the time down there. So they're like, ah, it's fine. They just probably, you know, they probably just moved, right, or something. And anyways, he ended up killing, like, many, many of these women and, and like, feeding them to the pigs on his farm. It was a horrific situation. Um, and so as a result of that, it just, you know, gave more energy to, like, we need to 
we need to recognize that there's a problem here. There's people being abused and exploited. And so Faye Blaney started that march, and now it's a huge thing, right? And the whole missing, missing and murdered Indigenous women, um, it's a bit, you know, became a national thing. But, but eventually they booted her off because she wasn't pro sex work. She was saying, you know, these people are being exploited. They're all drug users. They're sur- they're doing this to survive. So in a sense, they are choosing to sell their bodies to survive. But this isn't empowering. And our indigenous culture, you know, didn't have prostitution, right? This is uh, this is something that only came mm-hmm. after Europeans. So this isn't, you know, basically she was saying this is, you know, that prostitution is oppressive to to my people, my indigenous sisters, and so. I presented that in the class, right? I mm-hmm. knew that it would be controversial because I knew that most people there were probably pro sex work, but um, but oh yeah, my classmate, she was not having it. She was, and then she also connected that to this, you know, this there's a shelter in Vancouver called the Women's Rape Relief, and they won't allow trans men in there. Yeah. They eventually lost government funding because of that. Yeah. Um, but uh, she's like, oh, is this Fabulini? T- person attached to this so i didn't even know but like she was attaching it to all these other people and and so that was basically when we had our falling out because she was like oh well you're part of the you know you're a turf and a swerf and a smurf and all these oh, things yeah yeah and yeah, okay. then so she wants women over. to be selling their bodies yes yeah, so the pro-sex work argument is that um women can do whatever they want with their bodies you know if yeah. woman is poor and she you know at a go work at mcdonald's you can make six bucks an hour but if she can make more money um selling her body and providing for herself and her family then to deny her that is is uh is like misogynistic or it's uh you know denying her autonomy and agency Hmm. and choice Hmm. it'd be interesting to see if the person that you're describing ends up working with prostitutes or with uh you know giving getting social services to or even doing counseling with uh prostitutes and if that would change her point of view well it's interesting because i mean she's not foreign to that there are there are like sex work advocacy groups right um so Hmm. there are people who do that work who are saying this you know we want to do this this isn't a bad thing um oftentimes though a lot of them are people who who are um they have worked their way up to the point where they're maybe like managing other people or they they have another job and they do that as an additional job so it's it's less of the people who are on the bottom rung there's there's tiers right there's like mm. the survival at the bottom and then there's kind of like the doesn't have many other options maybe could do something else but they just don't have a lot of options that's like the bottom 50 percent and then the top 50 there's like you know maybe 80 percent who um who are just doing it because they can make more money and uh the higher up you go you know the more choice you have over who you work with and you know you can enforce more guidelines about what they can can and cannot do so yeah the higher you go up the more vocal the advocacy is essentially to say i want to do this because they have oh. less of the bad and yeah. they make more money because they can charge more right because yeah. they're huh yeah there is a yeah there is a class analysis uh that can be applied to a lot of the feminist movement specifically how sometimes they're fighting how it's just not one movement because there are different interest groups in the Mm -hmm. category of woman and the higher class women want, you know, access to abortions, but then access to later on marriage and then access to like, you know, different sorts of resources where, whereas uh, lower class women were probably better served by, uh, you know, different forms of, you know, social, uh, social enforcement and then social uh, welfare, let's say not, not just resources from the state to help mm-hmm. them, but also a state of being in society that would help them. And, and that state of being would probably uh, not be the same or not be as, um, yeah, it wouldn't be the same as like the, the liberal or the progressive woman who wants to just do whatever she want and, you mm-hmm. know, doesn't have to worry about, um, or doesn't have to, well, is more worried about not getting what she wants than, um, being in a situation where, uh, her wants are, are being drastically mismanaged by, you know, a society that kind of treats her like trash, right. Or men that treat her like trash. Yeah. Yeah. There's, as you go up in income or class, the more choice you have generally, 
right? And the more the more of a time and platform you have to advocate for those things, right? Um, for the women who are coming from the bottom survival, you know, they're doing it just to get by and to get drugs because, you know, they don't have any other way of, I mean, they could, but usually addicted and it's, it's, it's hard. There's not many people advocating for those people, right? Because most of those women die on the streets, right? They don't make it out. So they don't, you know, there's this one woman, Trish Bapti, when she was in the downtown East side doing that work and um, uh, she got out. And so now she's an advocate, but that is a very rare exception. And it's, it's really brutal listening to her stories because it's, it's quite violent. Right. But, but um, even though she got out and she's 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 talking, she doesn't really have a platform, right? She doesn't have power in society, right? She's she's just another another woman who got out, right? Whereas, you know, if you have money and resources and social connections, and yeah. your narrative is pro whatever the most progressive narrative is, then yeah. you're gonna get yeah. supported. Yeah, it's really yeah, it is really interesting. Uh, just bringing up like women's prisons and how the trans narrative that works within elite progressive uh, climate of you know do whatever you want, express how you want. We're gonna it's polite to just accept your identity as you want to identify. And uh, somebody just wrote on one of my previous videos. Um, pardon the term that they said you could either be nice or a piece of shit. So why would you just not be a piece of shit and just tell, call people how you want them to, how they want to be called? You know, this is, this man's a she now. Uh, so when it's, it's really simplistic, just be nice, be kind, go along with the thing. But when you actually look at the, the way that that, a way of thinking like we're just going to allow you to just assume whatever your gender is and we're going to go along with that because we're nice it's the nice thing to do to put serial rapists into the women's prisons right it's the nice mm -hmm. thing to do to give kids uh irreversible surgeries and uh and and hormonal uh, endocrine disruptors uh, because it's the nice thing to do it's like well what about all the uh the downstream effects of niceness and this might go back to what you uh something that changed in you about conservatism or reading about conservatives whereas we go from i mean a lot of us young people who grew up in the uh in the last 20, 30 years, going to the schools that we've gone to, we assume that liberal is the nice thing. You're, you're open-minded um, and you're, you're, you know more. And the conservatives kind of closed-minded and closed-hearted. But you mm -hmm. see, once you start to open it up, you see like conservatives just look kind of longer term thinking in, in a way, or, or it can be, uh, it is just as compassionate, but it's on a longer scale. Um, it's like, it, it's kind of being more respectful to the life cycle or to humanity in general or, mm -hmm. or in toto rather than the progressive individual who's thinking about the immediate desire and the immediate needs of somebody. Uh -huh. Yeah. I think I definitely was guilty of that. I remember there was, when I was going to my undergrad, there was a guy in our the Christian club I went to who was the token conservative in our group. I mean, maybe there was other conservatives, but he was the vocal one. And he was such a troll. And I remember just thinking like, ah, oh, this guy's such a troll. He's always trolling everybody. But now looking back, I kind of feel bad for him because I realized he was always getting ganged up upon. I mean, it's because, you know, he wanted to share his views. And, and I realized he probably just did that because it was easier to like take on that persona of the heel just to emotionally survive, right? When you're mm. constantly being like, belittled and told that you're you know bad or that you don't care i think that's the hardest part about um hmm. having whether you're conservative or anything just having views that maybe aren't you know mainstream or viewed as nice is that is that people assume that you're a bad person or they assume that you're um i don't know what they assume but they assume that something's wrong with you or you're morally hmm. deficient or something like i had a a colleague who um you know he was um we had a great rapport and like, you know, we'd laugh and just was one of my favorite, like people to chat to in between session and stuff. We'd share clients and refer clients to each other. Um, and then, um, when he found out that I, you know, worked with gender dysphoria, but from a more gender critical perspective where I, you know, I helped, you know, people to like wait and like, let's explore, right? Like to parents, I would advise them like, Hey, like the watchful waiting is, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a bad thing, right? This is what was always done with, with youth was to say, Hey, let's put, let's, let's wait, you know, let's not jump into social transition because social transition is a big deal. Right. Um, and so, 
so I guess I don't know what he found out about what I do, but once he found out that I wasn't, I don't know, aligned with whatever he thought was virtuous, he just like completely cut me off. Hmm. And he was like very upset and like he didn't even give me the chance to defend myself. Like he's like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. And I'm like, okay, like I respected that and I didn't, you know, say anything and haven't talked to him since, but but it was it was just such an about change, similar with the friend from university, right? It's like, oh, like you think this, and then there's all these assumptions. It reminds me when I was like going through um, training to become a police officer, because I worked in the jail and in various roles with the with the police, but not as a police officer. And they said like when someone when you're wearing the uniform, people just see you as a badge. They don't see you as a person, right? So that's why they'll often like respond so hatefully because they just you know however they feel about the police is how they feel about you, and that's what I think it is, right? They what, however they feel about conservatives or however they feel about whatever group they've lumped you into in their brain, mm. now you're one of those groups and it's just very tribalistic. It's very mm. sad. Yeah. So bringing up uh, gender, the gender topic, um, and not just specifically that, but what is the impact of the uh, progressive assumptions on on your profession right now and how do you navigate those? I think the the result is that people are either um, they don't want to work with gender, right? Like I've heard that from clients who have found me is that they've tried to work with people or they'll say like, I don't work with gender, right? And so I think there's a fear or there's a lack of knowledge. It could be a fear or a lack of knowledge, right? Um, or there's, um, uh, you know, they take the gender affirming approach, which isn't really therapy. It's really just agreeing with someone right and helping them get resources right so in social work that's actually a function of social work right is resource referral so oh hey you're transgender okay well maybe i can help you get connected with an endocrinologist or a primary care or something like that right so and that's a hmm. you know if someone wants services and you can help them get those services then then great right but that's not wow. really there that's not really therapy right no it's not can we pause on that for a second if if mm -hmm. social work i guess social work then is a arm of uh the state if if what it does is it acts as a uh you said a resource referral so whatever the state values that's what the so i don't know there's just something there where you're a functionary of the of the state so you're put you're plugging people into the system, and the system is using you to plug people into it. Uh, I'm, exactly. I'm just kind of like at this point in in, in my uh, career or in my thought life, like I'm really wary of Cthulhu of the state, and so just like kind of thinking of social work as you're not actually doing social work. Social work, you're not mm -hmm. you're not your job isn't to help society so much as help the state help society or help the state molds society in its own image by plugging it into resources that the state finds value in. Right. Well, I mean, I don't think that there's inherent anything. I don't see anything inherently wrong with referring people to resources. It's mostly because social workers, most of the time, social workers like in a hospital or who aren't doing like one-to-one -one work like I'm doing are mostly case managers. Right. Which means that you don't, see the person regularly right you might see them like once a month or maybe you just see them once and then you just have like an hour meeting with them you figure yeah. out what they need and then you yeah. help them connect them with what they need to get connected to so there's nothing wrong yeah. with that yeah. um the problem is is that social work is supposed to um social workers are only supposed to engage in evidence-based practices um and i don't think there's any specific guidelines in our ethics that we can only refer people to ethic to um evidence-based practices but you'd, you'd think that it would follow you'd think that if we ourselves can only practice evidence-based as in things that have been verified by science then we probably shouldn't refer someone to like reiki or something like that right i'm not saying that there's anything wrong with reiki but i don't think there's any studies necessarily showing that reiki works maybe there is i don't know um for those who don't know reiki's energy healing but um but so, but that's the problem, right? Is that there is no evidence-based care model for transgender because there's no model, right? Um, even if you don't do gender affirming, right? Like gender affirming, first of all, it's not even therapy, right? It's just a, it's just a medical it's a system, resource referral. Right? Yeah. 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 It's a medical resources that you can yeah. get, right? Hormones or whatever. Um, but, but the evidence 
Like the evidence that that produces good outcomes is not of good quality is the general consensus, which isn't really a standard of care. It's just this, we're not really sure if this actually works. So that's why generally we should say, let's be cautious and slow and wait, give people time to develop normally uh, mm -hmm. to adulthood. And then if they're still having a lot of dysphoria, then this is an option to treat that by you know, changing some of their secondary sex characteristics or primary sex characteristics to reduce some of that distress. It's a, it's a medical treatment. It's a strategy, mm -hmm. but you know, medicine generally is always supposed to start with the least intervention possible, right? Like if you go to the doctor and you have issues, they'll usually try and get you to like, you know, exercise or have a diet before opening you up. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so evidence-based care is, is, you know, it's not really talked about a lot, but technically that's what we're supposed to be sticking to as social works, hmm. social workers. What's the ev evidence basis for cognitive behavioral therapy then? Uh, there's a lot of good support for CBT. I mean, it's been around since uh, I think the fifties or maybe even longer. Um, uh, and generally speaking, CBT has good results for depression, anxiety, um, and OCD. Um, there's also CBT based therapies for trauma, like CPD and exposure, uh, prolonged exposure therapy, PET. So yeah, CBT probably has the most evidence behind it of any any one, just because it's been around the longest, and there's been it's cr it's created so many spinoff therapies like DBT, ACT therapy. There's so many second and third wave CB like cognitive behavioral therapies. Okay. Yeah, it's so, like the the yeah. acronym that that launched a thousand acronyms. <laughs> Basically, yeah. gotta love it. Gotta love those acronyms. So if I had anxiety, what would I do cognitively to my behavioral um, situation to achieve therapeutic results? Um, depends on the modality, but if it was from a CBT perspective, um, exposure therapy, right? So exposure therapy is basically exposing yourself to the feared situation to build up tolerance. So the more you avoid something, the more your anxiety increases around that thing, right? So if you have mm -hmm. social anxiety, for example, the, the, the more you seclude yourself, the more your social anxiety will increase partly because you're not getting exposed to that. So you're not building up a tolerance to being around people, but partly mm -hmm. because you're also losing the skills and abilities to have conversations, which makes you also more nervous and anxious about doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. So part of its exposure, that's a big piece. And then the second part is the cognitive part of like, what are your fears? What do you think is going to happen? Well, I think everyone's going to laugh at me. Well, helping people to check that with facts, like what, when have people laughed at you or what was the likelihood that someone's going to laugh at you and never want to be friends with you? Or doing a behavioral experiment, like okay, go talk to someone and look at their facial expressions. Did they laugh at you? Did they did they smirk? Did they reject you? Did they ignore you? Um, and then most people can, you know, they'll realize, or they may even know from the beginning. Yeah, I know that it's not. I know my thoughts aren't realistic. That's just how I feel, right? So it comes back to, I guess, those four components for social anxiety: exposure therapy, helping them to change their thoughts practicing sometimes practicing conversations or helping giving them like practical tools like what questions do you ask like how do you you know what if you don't know what to say or what if there's an awkward silence um and then the final one is just relaxation techniques so if you're feeling panicky and you're about to go in a situation you're wanting to avoid it but you know that if you avoid it you're just gonna get more anxious in the long term how do you calm your nervous system down through like breathing techniques mm. to uh be able to tolerate it for that moment hmm. There's this one cohort that, um, or there is a tendency of the younger generation, I guess people in their 20s, Gen Z, let's see, uh, let's say, uh, to be hyper therapized. And I've met them, uh, even detransitioners, they're still looking for a therapeutic fix. Uh, how do you mm -hmm. recognize when therapy is just somebody's like, do, do people just like reach enough therapy? It's like, okay, you have to, you have to stop thinking about this. Like, like therapy is not the answer. Therapy is like not the answer. Yeah. Do you, do you see that? And what are your thoughts on, on something beyond what's, what's beyond therapy? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'm definitely like, like I, I think therapy can help people, but I don't think it's the answer. Um, research shows that no matter what therapeutic approach you take, most of, basically all of them work. So it's it's not about special knowledge. It's not about special techniques. It's basically the relationship. 
It's having a relationship with someone who's supporting you, giving you some some knowledge, some way of being that you believe is going to work. So partly okay. it's placebo, yeah. um, and supporting you to do that. Accountability, community, and then and then you can sustain that. So so there's no magic going on there, even though you know each new modality that springs up, they claim that they're revolutionary. It's called the dodo bird effect, right? Everything works. So um, so, but we also know that therapy after a while people usually return to their base set point happiness right that theory is that like no matter how you know if you win the lottery or if you break your leg no matter how happy or sad you get you usually revert back to your whatever you were before after a period of time <laughs> so the only thing that really affects long term they did in the grand study was long term relationships so and i think that's essentially why most people what counseling is doing for people mostly it's a it's a stopgap for community for relationship that's just broken down in modern society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a aspect of uh, therapists are like secular priests. You know, they're they're confessional. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who, uh, I guess, if if you you could probably push it a little bit further, insofar as therapists or psychologists give speeches and sermons, they do kind of do the sermonizing. They kind of like say, "This is this is how you be a good person. This is this is what." I the one thing that's kind of missing, or when I talk to psychologists, psychotherapists, uh, counselors, it's like, okay, well, what is what is what is a man, you know, like, or what what is what is mankind like? That's more the religious, mm -hmm. like, the, yeah. like there's there's got to be some sort of religious certainty, um, or or else there's a vague notion of happiness or health or homeostasis. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, what is it to be a a, a good person is to you feel happy or are you being a good person mm -hmm. i guess how does how does religion inform or complete or extend your therapeutic uh theory on on the theoretical side rather and and maybe on the praxis side too yeah i i think it informs it and in, in like if i have a christian client i'll usually like try to access resources from the bible and from you know that prayer or whatever to help them, right? Because I think there's a lot there. Um, and if someone isn't a Christian, then I won't talk about, you know, Christianity or the Bible, but I might talk about things like purpose or uh, meaning or things like that. Um, it is very hard though, like, because without any, without anything outside of you, without anything that has created everything, it's, it's more just whatever meaning you can create for yourself, right? Which um, that doesn't seem to be as existentially satisfying to people um and it's very hard to do right how do you create your own meaning i mean people do it there's there's happy atheists right obviously um mm -hmm. but um but i definitely am leaning more towards you know i i think you know down the line i might end up in a different career uh, where i'm where i'm able to yeah use more spirituality and and stuff like that because i do find the secular counseling quite limiting in a lot of ways yeah and are you uh required to stay within the secular framework uh because of the way that you bill or whatever uh um, well i have to use like like i said i have to use evidence-based techniques so as long as right. i'm like you know doing cbt so you can't just doing... just shout jesus is the answer and and <laughs> and not not have a paper backing you up right? <laughs> yeah well i mean that's a good point, right? Like I was mentioning with flexibility with indigenous clients, like sometimes the work with I'm doing them, I wasn't, wasn't necessarily CBT, right? Like a lot of like talk therapy is very vague, right? Like, yeah. um, so, so you can't like, is there limitations? I think the limitation is just the person, right? And what, what they're open to, right? Like mm. if I have a Christian and I'm doing, I guess I'm doing like Christian counseling, right? So okay. um, maybe we might talk about God and they're fine with that. They want to. Right, they're yeah. looking for a counselor who does that. Yeah. Um, so, I think as long as it's not, as long as you're still doing something that resembles traditional therapy, you're probably fine, and your client okay. wants it. Right, you're not like imposing your own beliefs on them or trying to do, yeah, force. How did on them. How did God intrude into your life? Is it is this a lifelong? Uh, did you grow up in? The yeah, church? I grew up. I grew up in the church. Um, my dad was like a pastor on and off. Uh, was like a pastor on and off. That's rich. Good. Yeah, that's a weird that's way to a say story. it. He was a pastor at different points in time. He would work in construction, and then he was a pastor yeah, mostly yeah, before yeah. I was born. But there was a period when I was in my middle school years where 
he was a pastor again for a year or two. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I grew up, grew up with that. And then I kind of, you know, during my middle school years, I was kind of acting not Christian, like, like just partying and, and I felt bad about it. Like I felt like there was a, a disconnect, mm. uh, like I was living a double life. And then at a certain point I decided, okay, like I'm going to, I need to decide if I'm going to like follow God or just abandon it and do my own thing. And so I decided, okay, this is what I want to do. So I, so after that point, then it became more, can, can I made, I made ask it more my own. How you knew or what, what was the, what convinced you to go one way rather than the other? Um, I don't think I ever had any doubt about the truth of like, like I never had any doubt of doubts about God or anything. It was more just like, hmm. do I want to limit myself and not and en not enjoy, you know, partying and what everyone else is doing, right? Yeah. Like, um, uh, I had a friend in university who, you know, we were on the football team and he was like partying and stuff. And I was like, hey, like, I can't remember how we got around to it. I wasn't like trying to judge him or anything, but we were talking about it. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I think I just want to like put a pause on my faith for right now and just enjoy university and then kind of like pick it up again later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I think if I didn't follow God, that would probably be more it. Like, I still believe in God, but I'm just going to put a pause on that for yeah. now. Yeah, like what? What did? Uh, but what? But you're asking, it? like, what made me choose it? I guess what made me yeah. like decide I'm going to go this way. Um, I think that. Uh, well, there was a pivotal. There was a moment that was pretty impactful. My dad invited me and my brother to a conference called Promise Keepers. Promise Keepers is like a, a men's. I don't know if you heard of it, but yeah, I remember that. I remember that. They have that. like they still have around. Like, I don't know. I was when I was that age. I I looked at their website. I think they still do some stuff in the states, but. But yeah, that was that was pretty meaningful. Like there was a day long, and you know they had different speakers. And but the most meaningful thing for me was they do like have opportunity for fathers to bless the sons, and my dad did that for me. And and um, I don't even remember what he said, but I just remember like the feeling and the look in his eyes, and it was very powerful. And I remember someone coming up to me after and being like, "Whoa, like that was, that was like a kingly anointing." Like he was he was even blown away about what, about what my dad said. And so I think that um, that was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And then and then I think also that was the first time when I started to really just enjoy God. Like I would like put on worship CDs and just lie in bed and like just like sing for like hours and just be crying, like just enjoy, like feeling God's love washing over me. So I think it was the first time where it was more I was experiencing God rather than just like going to Sunday school and like eating cookies and juice after church right like it was actually like wow like god is amazing like he loves me so much it's, i've never felt this joy this is so wonderful this is so um i don't know yeah good hmm. having that experience i guess uh and then working in count is th how does that fit into your life choices with regard to helping other people being a christian uh, yeah, or uh, experiencing the joy of the Lord, to use a Christian term. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I bounced around with my career. I never, I never started with counseling. I think I was like, oh man, I had so many ideas. I won't go through them all, but I changed my mind multiple times about what I wanted to do. It was more interest based, less like of like a calling or a vocation. Okay. And even counseling, it it didn't feel really called to it, but it felt like okay, this could be a good option. And then I I did the one to one youth work and I was like oh I really like this I'm gonna I'm gonna do something like this. What's one to one um, youth work? What kind of stuff were you doing then? Uh, so, you know, like meeting up with I was a transition worker, so I was helping Indigenous youth transition from, like, high school to adulthood. Most some of them were still living with their parents. Some of them were in foster care, but all of them had like social worker involvement, and they might be you know street entrenched, which means like they skip school a lot and hang out on the street and stuff. So I would try to meet up with them and like help them like get jobs, get housing, uh, you know, budget, very like life skills stuff, you know, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And Sorry, what was what it was about that? Yeah. What was it about that that mm, turned, yeah, like put Made you me, yeah. forward then? Just I think like it was the just the way that you fit into people, the way that I think people it's just being able to, or? I think it's just building a relationship with somebody. Like I love, I love the fact that like I had a caseload of like maybe like 15, 12 to 15 youth and I would meet them, each one of them every week for an hour or two, sometimes more if like we had to like do something bigger, but, 
but I just loved like getting to know them, talking to them, like helping them, like journeying with them through life essentially. Um, and sometimes we get to do fun stuff too, right? Like one, one summer I did a summer program for a bunch of these youth and like we went out and like did camping and all this cool stuff. So, so I just like connecting with people. I think that's the, that's the, yeah. the enjoyable part of it for me. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, uh, indicated that you might end up doing something else later on, but at least yeah, I def- still be with people, I- you think? Yeah, I definitely feel called to be a pastor. I just don't know like about what the timing of what that might look like. Yeah. So I'm still... How old are you now, if I may ask? 34. 34, okay. You look 27. You have you have my kind of face, I guess. People, yeah, people think I'm younger than I am because I've got a baby face and yeah, I don't have a beard. I grew a beard from grad school because I was like, I need to look more mature, but it was a terrible beard. <laughs> terrible. Terrible beards. <laughs> my life with a terrible beard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Pastoring, uh, is a whole other can of worms. Uh, there's, there's an aspect of this that, um, the, of my job here that is counselor. And I could, I was very wary of going like anything pseudo pastoral, like with setting up, like, like trying to set up my own little, like, uh, you know, parish, I guess, uh, internet parish by, yeah. by having like these enclosed, uh, pay-per-view, uh, kind of content where you kind of say, mm-hmm. I'm kind of like a, a person. And there's, there's a, there's an aspect to the work insofar as it's like the influencer kind of stuff where you're a public intellectual, you're some sort of, uh, some sort of counselor plus or some sort of like leader of a community. Like there's something about yeah. being a leader of a community, especially online that I don't trust. Like in person would probably be, uh, there's more safe. Well, I guess there, there's, it's always danger of a cult of personality and stuff, but if you're working with a denomination and you're actually trained in this stuff, a lot of, um, though, you know, cults keep on happening. A lot of the entrenched established, uh, denominations have foreseen, uh, and seen this happen enough that they have tools and guidelines to keep this from happening. You know, they have different structures, mm-hmm. you know, with boards of trustees and stuff like that. Have you ever worked or what, what is your perception of the change from individual one-on-one counselor to somebody like, like a pastor in a church? Is that what you were thinking or like more like a chaplain work where, where you kind of like in an institution doing pastoral type care? Um, Good question. Can I put a pause on that? I realized I forgot to lock the door. So, oh no, I, is it okay if I? Yeah, I mean, you're in Canada, right? Bear's gonna pop through any time. <laughs> Just a second. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I work out of my son's room and sometimes when he comes home from school, I'll be in a session. I forget to lock the door and he just like pops in the room. He's like, where's my toy? I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> How old's your son? Uh, he's five. He's in kindergarten. Is he yeah. your first and only? Uh, first, we have another one who's almost a year old now. So wow, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we can talk about that, but um, but your question about pastoring, yeah, definitely thinking more of like you know traditional pastor of a church or something like that. Um, yeah. I never wanted to be a pastor. I always thought, oh, that sounds like say, the worst job ever. I never want to do that. Um, but um, but I think I think what's changed in me is. Uh, general disillusionment with the ability of counseling to like help society. Like I think it can help individuals for a set period of time while they're doing the counseling. Um, but uh, but seeing how like the societal need for meaning and purpose in community is so great and counseling can't do that. Hmm. And and I like I like connecting with people, but ultimately I want to help people. Like if I'm just connecting with people, but I'm not helping them, then then what's the point? And ob- like I said, I think I can help people doing this, but I think that I can help more people in doing that. So I think that's part of it. Yeah. How? How? Um, I think like the church is a community, right? So that provides a community for people to take part in. Um, and then I guess in like the teaching aspect of it is, is helping people, um, to helping people to, I don't know, align themselves with, you know, how God has made them and, and how God has gifted them. Um, and I think because of my experience with in university and through counseling, I think it gives me a, I think I have a good like idea of a lot of the things that people are struggling with in society. And also a lot of the, a lot of doctrines that have infiltrated the church that are, that are not 
from the Bible and that are causing a lot of damage in the church. Um, hmm. And um, and also just the gospel, right? I think that you know there is a social aspect to the church that is um, that is beneficial, right? Even if there's no, if it's not orthodox, right? Like a a Unitarian Canadian church is not orthodox, and I think there's some benefit to that. But ultimately, to me, the power of the church is the gospel, right? Is the good news. So, what's the essence yeah. of that good news to you? Um, the gospel is essentially. You know that Jesus came and he died on the cross for us so that we could be saved from our sin and we could have a relationship with God in this life and and forever and to me that brings me a lot of joy and it's changed my life and I think that's I think that's what brings transformation to people's lives is is knowing that God loves them loves them enough to die for them that everything they've done is is uh you know if they accept God's grace is thrown into the bottom of the sea, they don't have to, you know, um, they don't have to ruminate on all of the things they've done bad. They don't have to, you know, constantly feel condemned. Um, so it's, so it's, it's yeah. Christ behavioral therapy then. <laughs> CHBT. Um, yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, it's not therapy. I mean, there's, I think there's a there's an element of counseling. You know, there's I don't know if you've heard of the biblical counseling movement or the newthetic counseling. It's essentially like counseling, but with biblical principles. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's great. I think it's, I think that, I think that ideally, you know, we all we all give each other counsel. You know, we all can be counselors for each other. And I think the professionalization of counseling has really done damage to community and our ability to mm -hmm. rely on one another for counseling. Um, and I think biblical counseling has the other benefit that it's not, it's not, it's not like, oh, I'm telling you because I know better than you. It's like, Hey, let's look at what this book says. You know, apparently God wrote it. So he probably knows how humans work hmm. and let's see what it says. Right. So it's not, it, it, it so there's no chance of me being hypocrite, hip, like arrogant or like, oh, I have the knowledge. It's like, I don't have any right to say, you know, what, anything about you, but if you, if you profess to follow God, then this book does can say what you can and can't do. So let's look at it together and let's let's see what it says. So, so um, yeah. Is there a particular passage in the Bible that's been of uh, particular import for you in the last few years? Um, I mean, there's a lot. One that I've been reflecting a lot, a lot in the past year or so is Psalm 16. Um, and it talks about, it talks about how like God is our inheritance. Um, and the Lord is, it says the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. So it's like, I'm choosing God. It says the, those who run after other God, the sorrows of those who run after other gods will multiply. So if people, when people try to look for pleasure and joy outside of God, it increases their sorrows. Hmm. But it says that it ends with in your presence is the fullness of joy at your right hand, pleasure forevermore. So I really like that verse because I think it brings me back to, you know, the joy of being with God and enjoying God for himself, not for any other external reasons. And that's really, that's really, um, I think the draw, right. Is that like, is love, like what, what, why do people work, you know, so hard? Is it so they can make money or is it so that they can, you know, build a life for themselves and, and have love, you know, mm -hmm. give love and receive love. So, um, yeah, Psalm 16 has been really, I, I come back to that one a lot. I pray it a lot when I'm walking and thinking yeah. and stuff. How long have you been married? 10 years this year. 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. We dated for six years before that. So. Oh, wow. Okay. Long, yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, she's taken up almost half your life right now then. Wait, if you're 34 or 60, you made her when you were 18? We met huh? in first year university. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. you've been steady since then. Wow. Yeah. How how is um how is being a husband and how does uh, your faith uh, inform you uh, or uh, mold you or shape you or guide you in that that role in the world? Um, I think that um, I I often think about like Jesus. Like there's this verse where it says Jesus. Um, he he did not he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So the Orthodox Christian teaching is that Jesus is God, right? But but uh, but it says he did not account that equality with God something to be grasped or held onto. 
but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. So I think of that a lot is that like my role as a husband is to be like that, like to to empty myself and to serve my family, you know, lay my do- life down for my family um, and, uh, you know, be an example to my son and and uh, mm-hmm. be uh, be there for my wife. And and um, I guess the heart the heart of it is service. Yeah. Hmm. And do you have any uh, desire to, uh, being a pastor comes with uh, like sermonizing, do you have any desire mm-hmm. to, do you write? Do you, do you, you articulate your thoughts in one way or another? Uh, yeah, I, I have a blog on my website. I mean, I don't write on it a lot, but mm-hmm. um, I've written some articles on there. Um, I've done some talks and workshops at church, local churches and universities and stuff. What's the so, content of these? Generally? I do uh, various topics. I've talked about like, um, I've talked about sexuality. I've talked about gender. I've talked about, um, hmm. I guess like more Christian topics, just like you know, the Holy Spirit or or uh, you know, living uh, prayer. Like so, various different topics. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I really enjoy that. I really enjoy teaching and engaging people. What is the, from your point of view, and this might be a much bigger question that you weren't prepared to be asked, but what, what does the Bible say about gender? What does it tell us about yeah. gender? Um, well, I, I guess it depends what you mean by gender, right? Like if we take gender to mean synonymous with sex, is that what you mean? Is that how you're using gender? Like You can that... use it however you want to. Okay. <laughs> um, so I can answer your question how I want to then. Yeah, um, you can. I think that the Bible, I think the word gender is, is, has become too broad. I think before it just used to mean sex. So I'll, so I think, so in terms of sex, I'll, I'll talk, I'll, I'll, I'll answer both. So in terms of sex, you know, God, I think God created two sexes like men and women. Um, and, uh, and then in terms of gender, that's more like your expression, right? Like how do you, how do you express that in terms of your dress? and your role, right? How you relate to other men and women. And um, I think, you know, there is stuff in the Bible about, you know, prohibitions about um, cross-dressing and stuff like that. So I think, I think there is some, there is some emphasis in the Bible about conforming to gender norms, right? Uh, That men, you know, shouldn't, uh, you know, um, dress like women or, or women like men. But I think there's also some flexibility in that, that is just like more that we realize, like, it's more about, I, yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. I've thought about this a lot because, you know, before, you know, my mom went to Bible college at a time when like women weren't even allowed to wear jeans, right? Yeah. They had to wear dresses yeah. and she was a rebel. She would wear jeans under her dress, <laughs> but, uh, but which we all think is silly now. Right. But that was basically their, wh- why they were saying that was they're saying, okay, well, the Bible says, you know, we shouldn't, you know, mm-hmm. there should be, there should be a separation of gender norms. So, um, so I haven't done a lot of, honestly, I haven't done a lot of research and study on what the Bible says specifically about gender expression. But I think when it comes to the sex, sex part, the biological part, it's, it's, you know, there's two men and women. Yeah. Why? Why, why does the Bible say that? Or why do well, I? Well, I mean, if, if the Bible's the book of uh, answers, why, why did God create us as men and women? Is oh, there a spiritual did, reality? Why did, to, oh, why did it? he create us as men and I, women? I, Cause I know, uh, I've spoken with catholics about this and and they have uh, an answer about um god's expression of himself through man and through woman and how there's a a sacred aspect to sex that that uh, Mm -hmm. teaches us about god's love you know basically there's that kind of tact to it i'm wondering if that has any traction for you or if you uh if you've meditated on that i i just got married myself and and oh nice congratulations thank you i see her walking around i say that's a woman she's so different from me she she's got she plugs into the world differently than me she's teaching me something uh and i'm different than her and and our differences are complementary but they are profoundly different but at the same time we're both human yeah yeah but she's a woman i'm a man there's there's big differences there yeah yeah, that's a good question. I've often wondered that myself. Um, I think part of it is uh, for us to to um, to learn humility 
um, and to learn learn uh, the way of love, right? Which is uh, self sacrificial love, I guess. Hmm. Because when you yeah, when you when you join yourself to somebody else, and they're different from you, you have to, you know, if you just insist on your own way all the time. You can be constantly fighting, right? You have to lay down sometimes your own needs and wants for that other person. Um, and, um, you know, I think like in, in today's culture, like emphasis is a lot on like happiness, right? Kind of like you were saying, but the Bible never says that God, God made us so that we could be happy. I think he wants us to be happy, but that wasn't his primary aim in making us. His primary aim in making us was to be holy, which basically means to be like him, right? And be in relationship with him. Um, and, and, um, in marriage, it's basically like uh, someone use the analogy. It's like someone put in front of you, like a full length mirror, like marriage shows you your flaws. It shows you where you need to work on yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, I think partly it's a vehicle for, for, you know, becoming more, more like God, more, more loving. Um, and Mm -hmm. so I think there's that practical aspect, but I think the other aspect is just joy, right? Like. God created us to enjoy him and he created us to enjoy the world and he created us to enjoy relationships. And there's a, there's a, there's, you know, obviously there's so much joy in, in, in uh, being in a relationship with someone where you're, where you're intimate, right? Mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Um, There's a, there's a deep joy in that. Um, And there's a, there's a partnership of working together. Like, you know, we can accomplish so much more than, than what we can also, you know, to, to propagate the earth, right. There's, there's so many angles to it, right. It's yeah. such a deep question, yeah. which you could look at from so many ways, but, but. What about fatherhood? Yeah. How has that changed you? Uh, it's definitely like made me more patient, I think, cause I've had to be more patient. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's given me a lot more structure too. Like I always thrive on structure, but I feel like before I had kids, I could kind of afford to stay up late, you know, I could afford to like watch a bit more TV, read a bit more articles, mm-hmm. waste time essentially. Um, but with kids, when they wake up at like 5 a.m., you got to get up when they get up. So I think that actually disciplined me a lot to like, okay, I I can actually go to bed earlier and actually like it more because I'm more productive and I, I end up doing things that I value more, right? Hmm. Like, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but when I was a kid, my parents used to say nothing good ever happens after midnight. I feel like for for me at least because of my the way that I tick nothing really productive for me happens after like 10:30. Some people are different, some people are night owls, but I'm a morning person, so yeah. after 10:30 whatever I'm doing is probably wasting time. So hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And that's what your what that's what fatherhood is really nailed drilled into you. Well, it's one of the things like yeah, patience, uh giving me more structure in my life. Um I think also like just play like kids are so playful and joyful and they're so like in the moment. I think that's helped me because I can be, I can be very in my head, right? I love reading books. I'm like always reading a book, you know, listening to a podcast, thinking, and sometimes I can get like quite like, you know, daydreamy and lost in thought. Like one time when I was in grade five, I was daydreaming and I accidentally called the teacher mom and it was a man. And so mm. I was very embarrassed, but I've always been like, wow, that, so. you, you you remember that from 30 years ago, huh? I was embarrassed because, yeah, I was like, everyone laughed. But, but yeah, like, I think it's grounding. It's grounding to have kids. They're very in the moment, right? They're like, my son's five, so he might be thinking of like one week in advance at this point. He's not yeah. really thinking beyond. Yeah. But he remembers everything days. from a week ago. Uh, yeah. Well, he remembers things from even longer than a week ago. But he doesn't always talk about them, but he'll remember things from like, yeah, quite a while ago, which is, you know, yeah. like, wow, you remember that? So, yeah. yeah. So, so aside from this, uh, you're discontent, broadly speaking, with the ends and aims of secular counseling. How, what is your critique of the current uh, profession right now? And as it is, as it stands now? That's a good question. Um, I think my critique would be, I guess like a, I don't know if it's an arrogance or like a, a presumption that like 
people need us. They need counselors, right? Like I think most counselors would acknowledge that not everyone needs counseling and not all the time, but, but I feel like when you become a counselor and when you help people and it can make you feel like, Oh, like we're indispensable to society or like, cause I think that there's this general trend of like, you know, there's not enough mental health support. There's not enough mental health support. Like if only we had enough counselors and enough affordable counseling, then we'd be fine, which I don't think is true. Right. So, hmm. so I think that, um, I, I guess my critique of the general field is just that we, um, maybe it's not of individual counselors, but maybe it's about how we as society or how the government views the mental health system as like a bunch of individual counselors, right? Like, I don't think hmm. that's the answer. I think that, you know, the societal fabric has broken down. Community has broken down. People don't yeah. have meaning and purpose and relationship is a part of that. Yeah. And counseling is, tr you know, trying to fill that gap. And I think, until we do build those other things, like counselors do play an important role of giving people support and giving people tools. You know, sometimes it's just practical stuff, right? Yeah. Um, but, but I do think that, yeah, I think we sometimes can think, oh, like we just need more counseling, or you know, counseling is gonna like the reason people are depressed is because we don't have enough counseling or something like that. Which, yeah, I don't know if counselors actually think that. I think it's more of maybe like a. Yeah, I see it sometimes in articles yeah. or, or out yeah. there in the, yeah. in the ether. You know, there's a it's kind of off topic. It's just something you made me think of. It was, uh, I think it was from um, the Machiavellians by um, James Burnham, I think his name is. Mm -hmm. And, and it might not even be from there. Let me just Machiavellians. Yeah. Burnham, James Burnham. Um, but, or somewhere in political philosophy where it, I was reading about the, uh, the way that the church and the state used to work together, where the state or the kings, let's say, this is back in the Middle Ages, uh, the kings would allow the state to have certain, um, you know, tax breaks. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way it worked, but like the church was, uh, you know, didn't have to pay certain taxes or didn't have yeah. to do certain things, but it... Um, it was because the church was acting in the role or was serving the state in a way by keeping a lot of the records and, you know, kind of f fulfilling a lot of the uh, bureaucratic aspects that the mm -hmm. kings couldn't do at that time. And then as uh, society reformed into more modern times and the state became central and then the church became uh, kind of, there was this uh, so-called separation of church and state. Uh, for for kind of a period, which isn't really true, but anyways, the church does what the church does, and and the state does what the state does. But the state's not going to act in the in the form of a church, and the church is going to do whatever the church does over there with the human stuff and mm -hmm. and the God stuff, you know. But the state's about you know the functioning society and the roads and, and you know the mm -hmm. military and all that stuff. But as the state has expanded more and more, it's taking more and more aspects away from the church or assuming unto itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, functions that the church used to do, counseling, uh, community building, uh, charity mm -hmm. work, uh, all these mm -hmm. other, other, all these other aspects. And now we see in the current iteration in the last few years where, where it's start, starting to have more and more of a doctrinal aspect to it and more and more of a, a faith. The, the state has a faith that it that works within it, that, that it promulgates, you know, with acceptance and diversity and equity and all mm -hmm. these values of tolerance and, and so on and so forth. So it's like the, the church is now, the state is now becoming more and more like the church and the state again. Like there was this kind of like this, this kind of the splitting of these different aspects of, of, uh, so the social order into these two kind of categories. And, and, and now it's, it, it's being assumed in, into one whole thing and, and counseling, at least in social work, it's supposed to fulfill the role of the priest in, in a certain respect. And maybe, maybe mm -hmm. not, maybe, maybe not explicitly and stuff, but it's supposed to, the state's trying to serve, you know, so-called serve the yeah. humans there. And so is trying to provide human services to the humans. And so, uh, I just don't know if the state can have, uh, can do that without like having a, a positive vision uh, or, or a specific political ideological um, 
kind of belief system that informs it. I don't know if you can actually help people without some form of belief, some, some form of transcendent ideology. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like existential therapy or there's a whole therapy which focuses on those kind of things and it's secular. Right. But, um, yeah, I think what you're saying about social workers and counselors and psychologists is playing that role and can the state play that role and how the state even has its own kind of dogmas, right? So so how do you have separation from church and state when the when this, the state becomes its own weird new religion, right? Um, uh, and I think that um, it makes me think about this book I read called Radical Help is by this woman who's a social worker in uh, the UK. Mm-hmm. And she talked, she did some like uh, kind of innovative uh, programs um, where she would try to um, make changes to the social services in a way that would like make them more human, I think is the mm-hmm. best way of kind of summarizing it. So <laughs> for example, the, uh, one of them was, you know, there were, there were these families which were which would were an, uh, a sort of disproportionate drain on resources, right? So you know maybe a single mom with teen boys who are causing trouble in the neighborhood, so they always get like police calls to the neighborhood or or ambulance or social workers. Basically, you know these families uh, they have a lot of resources sort of like pushed towards them, and maybe they have a lot of workers, right? Maybe there's like a team of workers around them, right? Psychologists and social workers and police and all these people, but but it's not making any changes, right? Like they basically yeah. are responding to crises and they come and see them for maybe once a month and then they like tick a box or maybe refer them to something, but no one's living life with them. No one's helping them. They just have all, and it's costing so much money. So what she did was, was she, um, she hired a team of people and she interviewed people from different fields, like social work, I think policing, nursing, like a, a few different ones. And eventually there was five people. And they basically were going to be assigned to that family. Like you, your only job is to help this family. And they committed to only doing 20% of their time to paperwork and 80% of their time to FaceTime. So in most kind of like social work jobs, it's probably more like 50, 50. Um, so, or maybe even less, but so, and it really helped, right? Like basically uh, my theory is that the, the social support and the community that it gave the mom basically helped her to, get out of her constant crisis to crisis spiral and actually be able to, you know, work towards finding a part-time job. Like if you're constantly living in crisis and survival mode, like you're not able to move forward. Right. So it was, uh, the program was a success and, and the, you know, in the calculations, the cost of that team was much less than what, you know, they would spend on that family over like, you know, years and years and nothing, nothing have no benefit, tangible results. Right. But um, it couldn't be implemented because the state, I think it's impossible for the state to implement programs that are truly human because of the bureaucratization and because of safetyism, right? There's so much liability. Like you can't, you can't, and when you're supporting friends or family or doing things, like sometimes you have to go after hours. Sometimes you have to do things that aren't like, you know, might be against policy, right? So there's so much red tape around like just being able to be there for someone and and help someone life on life that it basically makes it impossible. And that's what people really need. So I think even just from that practical aspect is that so many aspects of how the state works and functions are so bureaucratic and so obsessed with safety and of liability avoidance, right? Is that it dehumanizes the service to the point yeah. where, yeah. you know, the person just comes in, checks in, oh, how are things going? Oh, do this and this and this, you know, give some advice. Oh, maybe add another referral, add another meeting that you have to go to where someone will ask you how your week goes and give you advice, yeah. right? It's just yeah. very watered down. Yeah, yeah. And do you feel like your work is uh, closer to the the human uh, than the than the bureaucracy at this time? Uh, I think so. Like I'm in private practice now. I used to work for the government, oh, okay. and yeah. in private practice, it's very I have a lot of freedom, right? To and people have freedom to work with me or not. So I think that mm. humans, one aspect of their identity is freedom, and I think when people have freedom, it's you're able to help them more, right? Because they're choosing something for themselves. They're paying for it, so they're more invested in it, right? When I work for the government, you'd have a lot of people no show, or they're not as invested in it because they're not paying it out of their own pocket, mm-hmm. or they're very entitled, right? The service ends and they then they get mad, right? It's like, well, we gave you the service, like, weren't you happy that you at least got something at all, right? So, there's a sense of entitlement. So, I do think it's more human, 
but just for practical reasons, like it's not available to everyone, right? Because money, like I have yeah. to live, not everyone can afford it, right? So I do offer sliding scales with some of my clients. I, you know, they don't pay my full fee because I want to be able to see some people who can't pay the full fee. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's not access. Counseling is not accessible essentially yeah. to everybody. Yeah. 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 Well, David, thank you so much for reaching out and to for allowing me to uh, probe your head. A role reversal, but it was a, actually a good back and forth that we had here. Yeah, thanks for having me on, and it was really good talking to you. And I re always really appreciate your conversations. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Glad it was great. Do you have any uh, big plans coming up? I know it's winter time, but maybe you're gonna go hunt a moose. No big plans, but I am planning something uh, for the school, for my son's school, uh, which is a play club. Oh. So I've been wanting to do this for a while. It's basically just a space for kids to play outside with parents there, but not like interfering with the play. So it's like free play. Yeah. Um, and so I'm meeting with some parents tonight to talk about oh, implementing cool. it. So yeah, yeah. kids need more that. play. Parks need yeah. to be st stocked up on kids more. 100%. 100%. Like, too empty nowadays. Yeah, so, totally. Good luck with that. Awesome. Thanks a lot, man. I'll right. uh, I'll hit you up when uh, this is uh, published. All right. Okay. Awesome. All right. All right. Yeah, have a good night. Take care. Yeah.